There was a spinoff from the Cosby Show years ago called A Different World, and it was featured young African Americans off at college, and how college was a completely different world than growing up at home. And it was a really good show. I think it was only on for about six seasons, but I enjoyed it. And I think one of the things we need to keep in mind when we come to a book like Deuteronomy or any of the primitive biblical books is that we're dealing with a different world. You know, sometimes it's so hard not to look at things from an ethnocentric perspective. Oh, that culture is so different than my culture. My culture is way superior to the cultures in the Bible in every way. And there are a lot of ways in which our cultures are to be preferred, but there are also a lot of things we can learn from other cultures. We can also keep in mind that just because a culture is primitive doesn't mean that God could not have spoken his word to and through that culture. The antiquity of a civilization has no bearing on the truthfulness of the message that God is conveying at that particular place and time. So let's keep in mind, God has spoken truth at different times, at different places, to cultures both ancient and modern. And here in Deuteronomy chapter 23, we see some laws that are familiar and we can relate to them and others that are completely foreign. And we have to remember it's a different world and God is accommodating his revelation to a people living in a different, very different place and time. But there are timeless eternal principles that God has for us in his word, even in those fine print places, those challenging places. Let's pick up the action in Deuteronomy chapter 23. These are laws relating to people and their accessibility to temple for worship. <laughs> no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord. That's one of those foreign culture laws that make you scratch your head and go, what? Why is that the first verse of Deuteronomy chapter 23? Who cares about somebody's physiology when they've come to worship God. What is going on with this strange command? Well, first of all, people who have been emasculated by crushing or cutting often did it because they were giving themselves over to a pagan god. It was a another one of those pagan practices where somebody would give themselves over to foreign pagan worship. And so the idea behind this is that you don't want anybody who has been given over to idolatrous worship access to the holy parts of the temple. That is what is behind that. There has to be somebody completely devoted to the Lord, having accessibility to the assembly of the Lord. Um, number two, verse two, no one born of a forbidden marriage nor any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. There was the concern for syncretism with pagan worship and pagan customs and pagan culture. God wanted Israelite worship to be uniformly focused on Yahweh alone, not on any of the tribal or pagan deities. And those who bring who are married to those who worship other gods, you know, God wanted to keep that stuff separate. That was the purpose behind that command. Now, later on in the Haftorah, in Isaiah chapter 56, earlier in Isaiah, Ch Isaiah chapter 19, there is provision made for people in different cultures to come to the temple of the Lord, provided they have devoted and dedicated themselves to worshiping the God of Israel. One of the problems that happened in Israel years later was that people worshiped the God Tammuz in the innermost sanctum of the sanctuary, according to the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 14. And God was trying to discourage Israel from making those sorts of pagan accommodations, and they failed to listen to God, and they brought it in there anyway, but that was the purpose behind it. 
was the preservation of pure, devoted worship to God. Verse 3, no Ammonite or Moabite or any of their descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord, not even in the 10th generation. Well, why is that? The Ammonites and the Moabites treated Israel very poorly and opposed them as they were coming through the wilderness on the way to the promised land and tried to make war with them. And Balak hired Balaam to curse the Israelites. And so God is saying the people who are opposed to you and want to make trouble for you, either by accommodating you to pagan customs or by harming you physically, they shouldn't have access to the Holy of Holies. They should not have access to the temple of the Lord. Look at verse 4. They didn't come to meet you with bread and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. And they hired Balaam, son of Beor, from Pethor and Aram, Naharaim, to pronounce a curse on you. However, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you, because the Lord your God loves you. Do not seek a treaty of friendship with them as long as you live. Unfortunately, as we read through the word of God, the Ammonites and the Moabites constantly opposed Israel. And as soon as David became king of Israel, he actually sent a delegation of peace to the Ammonites. It's in violation of this. God said, don't seek a treaty of friendship with them. David did. And in turn, for David's kindness, they humiliated his men and sent them away. You can read about it in 2 Samuel chapter 10. And so God's word came true that these are cultures that are completely opposed to the existence of Israel. And even today, there are communities and cultures that have an age-long bitterness against Israel. And, and, and God is saying, hey, they are out there and you need to be wise. Verse 7, do not despise an Edomite. For the Edomites are related to you. Esau, Jake, Jacob's brother, is also called Edom. He is the father of the Edomites. Now, Israel and Edom have a very sordid military history. And then when Israel, when Judah's temple was destroyed in 586 BC, we find out in Lamentations that the Edomites were rejoicing and celebrating. And so it's very sad. But nevertheless, Israel was not to hate the Edomites. You know what's interesting about this? As hard as it was to do this, King Herod was an Edomite. The, the king who was king over Judea at the time Christ was born in Bethlehem, and he tried to kill all the babies in Bethlehem two years old and under because he was trying to kill the baby Jesus. And so when you think about do not abhor the Edomites, and yet one of the most horrible Edomites of them all is going after the Christ child. Man, that, that's a hard one. But I think in that particular instance, the Holy Family did what was right, and they got out of Judah and escaped to the land of Egypt until Herod died and was replaced by his son Archelaus. That was the right thing to do, Matthew chapter 2. But you certainly can see that there's a historic thing going around here. Do not despise an Egyptian because you resided as foreigners in their country. You know, they were there for over 400 years. And, you know, we have to, sometimes after we've been with somebody for a while and we're no longer with them, it's tempting to want to harbor a grudge because you're no longer with them or they're no longer with you. But with the help of God, we can remember the fact that they, we were with them for all those years. And, you know, I did not always get along with family members growing up, but I grew up with them all those years. They took care of me for all those years. You can't hate people who love you and took care of you, even if you did have some bumpy times, right? I think that's a takeaway from this passage. Don't hate the Egyptians. You were there for over 400 years. It got bad toward the end and I pulled you out of there, but don't hate them. In fact, we find out later on in Isaiah 19 that there's a place in the world to come 
for all Egyptians who turn to the Lord. And that's true. There's a future for the man of peace, Psalm 37, 37. There's a future for anyone and everyone who turns to the Lord. All right, now we move on to uncleanness in the camp. Verse 9, when you are encamped against your enemies, keep away from everything impure. If one of your men is unclean because of a nocturnal emission, he's to go outside the camp and stay there. Soldiers who were in the military had to be totally devoted to God and the mission that he had them on. That's the, the purpose behind those laws. And there, were, there was ritual uncleanness until evening for something like this. Now, our uncleanness is completely taken care of once and for all through the sacrifice of atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross. But without that, you could become, before Christ, people became unclean just about every single day by something they did or something they said or something that was done to them. Verse 12, designate a place outside the camp where you use the facilities and you know, we know that. <laughs> As part of your equipment, have something to dig with. Like I said, I called this chapter a different world, right? You know, you're, they're living in the wilderness. They need to have rules for cleanliness and sanitation in the wilderness when you got that many people. Verse 14, for the Lord your God moves about you in your camp to protect you. God wants to protect the people. That, that's the purpose behind these pieces of legislation. He wants to protect them spiritually so they don't have people devoted to pagan gods worshiping alongside them in the temple to the true God. God wants to protect them militarily from people who would do them harm, and he wants to protect them sanitarily. Your camp must be holy so that he will not see among you anything indecent. And now we move to verse 15. If a slave has taken refuge with you, do not hand them over to their master. Let them live among you wherever they like in whatever town they choose. Do not oppress them. Remember the book of Philemon? Philemon escaped from his master um, um, and Onesimus, and he came and, and took refuge with Paul. And Paul was going to send him back to Philemon, but he was sending him back as a brother. He was discouraging him from taking him back as a slave. And we see precedence for that right here in the Torah. And the reason why is they should know what it's like. They were slaves for over 400 years. And since they were able to get their liberty, they should honor somebody else wanting their liberty. We see that in the Old Testament. There, are, there is legislation regulating slavery, but there's a forward progression in the word of God toward liberation rather than oppression. And then we move to verse 17. No Israelite man or woman is to become a shrine prostitute. There was in pagan religions, and this is another reason why God doesn't want pagan worshipers alongside worshipers of Yahweh in the temple of God. There were pagan prostitutes who would practice prostitution in shrines and give a large number of the proceeds over to the shrine and that's how they got money and god is saying the people of faith the worship of god should not be funded by sin don't bring the earnings of a female prostitute over a male prostitute in the house of the Lord your God to pay any vow, because the Lord your God detests them both. Jeannie and I were watching an old episode of Good Times. That was a TV show from the 1970s. And the father had returned some money that had been lost at the grocery store that he had found. But he kept $2,000 for himself because he was pretty sure the grocery store was not going to give him a reward. And Florida, his wife, wanted James to give the money back. And then the pastor came over and Florida said, well, my husband wants to keep some of that money. Is it right for him to do that? And the minister said, perhaps. <laughs> and then another person said, well, shouldn't he give it back? And the minister said, perhaps. <laughs> well, wouldn't that be the right thing to do? 
And the minister said, perhaps. And JJ says, if he says one more perhaps, I'm going to go crazy. <laughs> and it's just unbelievable that, you know, what a compromised minister that was in that TV show. But the idea is that how could the church profit from money that was taken illegally from the grocery store. You know, for the minister to even say perhaps, that's crazy. But God is saying that's not how we want the worship of God to be funded. For this reason, some churches won't take an offering from somebody who won money in the lottery. If they're giving their lottery or Las Vegas winnings, and giving a portion of it to church. Some churches won't take it. I could be wrong, but I think there are denominations who even have that in the bylaws, that they're not allowed to take that kind of money. You know, I don't go around asking people where they get their money, but, and I'm not even persuaded that that's a proper application of this rule. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's interesting that God wants the people to trust in him and trust in honest provision rather than go into sin to fund your worship. Okay, and then it goes on to say, verse 19, do not charge a fellow Israelite interest, whether on money or food or anything else that may earn interest. You may charge a foreigner interest, but not a fellow Israelite, so that the Lord your God may bless you in everything you put your hand to in the land you're entering the possess. Well, we don't do anything like that at Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church. But the only possible link that I can think of is that when it comes to using the church for weddings and funerals and stuff like that, we don't charge members at all. I think there's a custodian that you, you pay the custodian to clean up before and after, but there is no, we don't charge anyone to, because membership has its privileges. You should be able to use the facilities of the place where you're a member of, but for non-members, there are fees that you would pay and basically this is you can charge you know non-member interest but um, a brother israelite not verse 21 if you make a vow to the lord your god do not be slow to pay it for the lord your god will certainly demand it of you and you will be guilty of sin well you say well wait a minute didn't jesus overrule this it says in Matthew 5, 33 to 37, do not break your oaths, but keep the oaths you've made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by God's throne, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Does that mean we shouldn't make any vows at all? Not necessarily. It means that you shouldn't have to make a vow because you're saying you're going to do something should be good enough. I think that's what that what Jesus is saying. You shouldn't even have to make a vow. You, when, you, when you tell somebody you're going to do something, you shouldn't have to say, I swear. You should just keep your word. However, if you do, it says, don't be slow to keep your promise. Verse 22, if you refrain from making a vow, you will not be guilty. I think you're farther ahead to just keep your word and not make a vow. <laughs> Verse 23, whatever your lips utter, you must be sure to do because you made your vow freely to the Lord your God with your own mouth. Now that could be taken out of context. You remember in Judges chapter 11 and 12 when Jephthah made a stupid vow. He said, if God gives me victory in military battle, I will sacrifice the first thing that comes out of my house. And he was thinking an animal because ancient Israelites often kept animals on one side of a one-room house. But when he got home, his daughter came out of the house. And he said, well, I got to sacrifice my daughter. Well, that's a stupid vow, you know. But we are to keep um, vows of integrity, but you don't have to... Say you, know, you don't keep something if it's wrong, if it's stupid. Anyway, you've got to use common sense. Verse 24, if you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat all the grapes you want, but do not put any in your basket. You remember I told you the other day that a lot of the laws in Deuteronomy parallel passages in the Gospel of Luke, and here's another one. Remember when... I think I'm trying to remember which chapter 
I know it was in Matthew chapter 12. I'm trying to remember the parallel chapter in, in Luke where the disciples are going through the grain field on the Sabbath and they pick the heads of grain and rub it in their hands. And Well, the Torah says right here that you can eat all the grapes you want on the fly, but do not put any in your basket. If you enter your neighbor's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands, but you must not put a sickle to their standing grain. And so that was kind of like the nation's welfare program, allowing people who are passing through to pick grapes to eat or grain to eat on the fly. It was, you know, a chance to be neighborly to those in need who were passing through. So it's a different world, isn't it? It's a, a world of agriculture, an agrarian society that did things and tolerated things that we don't practice in our culture today. And yet God still spoke to them. God provided for them. He gave them his word to protect them spiritually, to protect them militarily, to protect them sanitarily, and to give guidance. Everything God does is for our good. We may not understand it, and sometimes we have to take off our 21st century glasses and try to read the text as if we were living in that particular culture at that particular time. But everything God does is for our good. He sent Jesus for our good, to die on the cross for our sins and rise again. And if you repent of your sin and put your faith in him, he'll wipe out all your sins, give you eternal life, and he will be with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus loves you. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. You guys have a wonderful day. We're praying for all those who are battling COVID in our particular parish community. We had people, a lot of people who had COVID last year. We have a lot of people who have gotten COVID at this time of year. And it's interesting. It's not that it's different people. I, I, we don't, I don't know of anybody who has got who had it last year at this time and now has it this year at this time but still it is not to be taken lightly and we need to pray to god for his presence and healing power and pray for all the doctors and the staff who are ministering to them and pray that people will do all that they need to do to keep themselves safe jesus loves you this i know for the bible tells me so have a great day